All right, you're very welcome along to an RT Rugby podcast special over the Christmas period. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by former Connacht and now Stad Oriak uh, flanker Owen Masterson, who's joined us to tell a, tell us a little bit about what life is like in the, the Pro D2 in France and look back a bit on his Connacht career. Owen, thanks a million for joining us. I suppose the, the first question people want to know is what's life like in the in the Pro D2 in France? Well, thanks very much, Neil. No, it's it's great to be on and chatting to you. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed my time so far in uh, Oriac. Uh, we're in obviously December now. It's it's flown by. To be perfectly honest, um, we have our a match against Rouen coming up against this week against us this weekend now, and um, hard to believe that'll be our fifteenth game in in the Pro D two. The the games come thick and fast here, and um, yeah, I suppose it's all been a bit of a whirlwind. To be honest, I, I suppose for every time I found out that I wasn't going to be playing with Connacht for the, for the next season and obviously was very disappointing news at the time but your attention quickly turns to what's the next step um, I wasn't going to be 29 until April and still felt I was very much in the in the prime of my career and and wanted to keep playing and um, unfortunately last year was, was a pretty tough year for a professional rugby player to be looking for work and as you'll seen uh, as you'll have seen since with Wasps and Worcester you know there's a, a lot of players looking for jobs and, and can't find them. Um, I suppose what happened to me was I had a, a very good friend, Paddy McAllister, who I knew from playing with Connacht and Paddy himself had obviously played with Ulster and then moved to Oriac and had played with Gloucester. And then I met him at the at the end of his career in, in Connacht. And um, he just gave me a call one day around around May time and said, look, I'm sorry to hear you're, you're, you're leaving. And, you know, what, what are you thinking of doing? I said, oh, I'm, I'm keen to keep playing. I'm, I'm, I'm keen for any, any option available at all. I'm willing to go anywhere and keep playing. And um, the next day, Paddy gave me a call. He said, I've actually had a, I just had a phone call. I gave the vice president of, um, of Oriac a call and I sent him on your footage that you sent me. And uh, I think they're going to be keen to, to have you in. And it, it seems so bizarre that when it happened, it happened that quick because I've been alert, uh, searching for, you know, clubs all of February, all of March, all of April and majority of May. And then within two days um, and I called from a friend, I was, uh, I was heading over to do a medical in France and, took my three weeks holidays then and then was back into pre-season at the end of June uh, start of July and yeah as I said it's flown by since um, and almost at, a, at the Christmas break now for the Pro D2 which is uh, really much appreciated as a professional player uh, there's there's a gate break in the season for two weeks which uh, I will take full advantage of yeah yeah that's the, the uh, that kind of leads into what I was going to ask you about obviously the the durability needed in in that league and how the games are just coming one after the other as you said like this will be going out probably later on in December, but you know we're speaking here today. It's the thirteenth of December. You've had, you've had fourteen games so far this season. You've played in twelve of those. You've played. They've they've mainly been starts. You've played eighty minutes in the bulk of those as well. Like it's probably been quite a quite a time since you've got to this stage of the season and you've had ten to twelve games under your belt by mid December. Yeah, no, absolutely. But what I will say, I suppose, from a player point of view, I found the schedule to be incredibly player friendly as well so obviously you know rugby club rugby is massive in france and with the tv deals as well pro d2 always has a game on a thursday night and then the rest of the pro d2 games are on a friday night for the television on canal and then the top 14 games do be on saturdays and sundays so for pro d2 the schedule is pretty consistent unless you have a thursday game you play on a friday we come in and review on a saturday uh, depending if it was an away game because we always bust back we might have the saturday off and then come in and review and pre- prep for the next game on a sunday train Monday, train Tuesday, recovery day, Wednesday, captain's run Thursday, and then play again on Friday. Um, and the blocks are p- pretty consistent as well in that we do a block of five games and then a, a week of no games and then you go again. So yeah, it's, 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 it is pretty condensed, but I've also found it to be very player friendly. But um, yeah, I, I've absolutely loved, I suppose, getting the game time, obviously, um, been a while, as you said yourself, since I would have had racked up that many minutes and that many um that many appearances, which which has been great. And you kind of find yourself getting into a rhythm as well. The more you play, the more you feel yourself able to play, and that kind of you get that match fitness and that kind of durability built up a little bit. So um yeah, it's it's been great for me personally. I can't really say a bad word at all about about the league and about Oriac at all. And off fair as well, you mentioned one of the the joys of it is the, the little Christmas break you have coming up. Like normally you'd be this time of the season, you'd be getting ready for a couple of big interpros Christmas week, you know, probably St. Stephen's Day and then one new year on, on New Year's weekend as well. A nice little change of pace that you don't have that. Yeah, no, it's look, obviously the, the interpros over um over Christmas are massive games that you're really keen to play in as well. But it obviously, 
you know, it goes hand in hand. You, you can't, you know, be a professional rugby player and expect to enjoy your Christmas like that as well. You, you, you know, you have to choose one or the other, which which was the case for, you know, the last, my last nine years in Connacht. But um, yeah, I'm not complaining, certainly about the, the break for the Pro D2 and the lads themselves uh, seem to look forward to massive, massively as well. We've, as I said to you, we've, we've one big game coming up now. So the focus has been on putting in a big effort this week. And then, you know, we've been told to go off and enjoy the Christmas as best you can. And we're at the halfway point then and we'll make a big charge. Uh, you kind of touched on the you touched on the exit from Connacht and you know finding out the news. You said it was it was back in February. I might go back to to that day when you did find out. Like how does how does that happen? Are you just kind of called in one afternoon after training to get the news? Is it like a scheduled meeting where you were going to go in and and actually talk about you know a potential contract? How does how does that actually operate for yeah. for those on the outside who who wouldn't have a clue? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question, and I suppose myself personally you probably always be when it's when it when you're when you know your contract's out you know you're always very keen to play and you're very nervous if I get an injury now or if I if I don't play for a few games in a row that you know maybe it, it won't it won't do me any favors with with my contract up for renewal so I suppose the truth of the matter is I kind of had a bad feeling from early on in the season I think you know I was fit and available for pre-season um you know kind of played two pre-season games off the bench uh, the first game off the bench excuse me and then played the second preseason game and then when the first competitive game came around I was not in the 23 and the same for match day two and match day three and match day four and then eventually I uh, got my opportunity to play in in match day five against Ulster in the Viva Stadium which was which was a great win for us and you know one of my one of my fond memories playing with Connacht and then it, there was a big gap in the URC I think we'd about three or four weeks off and then when the team came out for round six I was back out of the 23 again so then I, you kind of start to get a maybe a bit of an uneasy feeling so maybe I'm not in the plans I'm not playing as much as I used to. Um, you know, obviously I was a no longer really a young player that they were maybe looking to progress down the line. I, I was a player with with a hundred caps, and you know, when you're at that stage and you're not into twenty three and you're not you know contributing on the field, you kind of start to think, okay, maybe I'm surplus to requirements here. Um, I suppose as the season went on, I did manage to play a few more games. Um, kind of off the bench here and there when there was injuries. Uh, and then I suppose my last game before I kind of knew for definite was we played at home against um, against Glasgow. And, you know, we had, a, we had a very bad loss, but I suppose from a personal kind of point of view, I was kind of proud of what my efforts on the field and proud of, of um, you know, what, what I produced. But then when the team came out for the next game, I wasn't involved again. And then I said, OK, it's, it's time for me to go in here and have this conversation, first of all, around selection for the week. And then, um, and then I suppose that led into a conversation around, okay, what's, what's the future look like? And uh, yeah, I suppose I got the news then that it, it was, it was unlikely that I was going to be staying on with Connacht and uh, look, no qualms about how it was handled or anything like that. I thought uh, Andy Friend was very respectful and how he did it. And it was very helpful to me as well in trying to take the next step as well, whether it was staying in the game playing or to move on to something different. Um, so yeah, look, that's just the nature of Professor Obi. It wasn't too nice, and obviously, maybe not something I, I'd agree with as a professional player. You always feel that you know you're you're the best, and you should be involved every step of the way. But um, that that's that's how it happened. And uh, as I said, it was probably the hardest bit was probably February, March, April, May when you're trying to find out what the next step is, and it's just very unclear what that next step is going to be if there's going to be anything in rugby for you. So that's uh, that's how that um, panned out. So you said you like it had, it had been in your mind for a while, probably that the you, you yeah. didn't have a good feeling. You you were kind of saying over over those few months. Exactly. Exactly. And does well, that sorry as well? Does that kind of does that affect your performance in training? Does it affect you much when you're when you're out playing in matches? Are you are you conscious of the fact that you feel you have a point to prove? Maybe when you're out there or you're in a into those final few months of a contract. Um. Well, I'd like I'd like to say no, it didn't affect me, and I went about my business as usual. And I I think to be perfectly honest, maybe while I was training and while I was playing, I, I'd like to think it didn't affect me. But it probably it's probably when you're off the pitch and you're spending a lot of your downtime thinking about it a lot and going back and forth in your head and trying to um trying to maybe plan theoretical kind of um pathways in your head of what might happen. And um, but yeah, I suppose I, I suppose particularly after that Glasgow game. I was particularly upset. You know, we, we'd obviously had a bad loss at home, but I was I was kind of particularly upset upset after that game because I kind of knew after a bad result that I wasn't going to be in the mix for the for the team the the following week. And I kind of I kind of had a feeling in my in my own head that geez, that might be the last time I um I play for Connacht. And I suppose 
I think the la- next time I played for them was the last game of the season, which I really, really appreciated being, uh, you know, getting a run out, getting a run out uh, in the sports ground one last time with a few of the other departing players and alongside my brother as well uh, in a home game against Zebra. So, yeah, I think I think the Glasgow game was my second last game and um, then Zebra, was the last game of the season, it was the next time I played again. So, yeah, yeah, I suppose to answer, to answer your question, I'd like to think it didn't affect my performance and my approach to training. Um but definitely off the pitch, it definitely weighs heavy on the mind. And you said you were straight back to it with, you know, trying to map out the future, figuring out what was coming next. Was there was there any part of you that thought, you know, I'm you were what, 28, 29 at that stage. You've had a decent 100 plus games of professional rugby. You've come through it, you know, fit and healthy. Is there any part of you that thinks, do you know what, I might move on here? Or was it straight on? I'm going to find a new club. There's going to be another chapter. Well, certainly what I wanted to do was to keep playing and there was absolutely no point of me, no part of me that wanted to do anything else. But at the same time, I had to be kind of practical and think, OK, look, I can't I can't, you know, let let June, July, August come around and have no plans in place for anything else. So, you know, yeah, it's kind of, the phone, the phone mightn't ring. Unfortunately, yeah, you know, that's exactly. Good. So I, I was I was definitely very conscious of having a plan B and whether that was going back to college or going and play in. Uh, go and play in AIL and try and get a job like that or to get involved in some coaching Um, you know I, I did a lot of kind of soul searching of what my ideal plan B would be but um, certainly I'd know um, I knew what my plan A was and that was, was to keep playing professional rugby at the highest level I possibly could and what, wherever that was and yeah very as I said very grateful that Paddy McAllister picked up the call, picked up the phone and called me and um, that I'm, I'm, I got an opportunity to play in the French Pro D2 with Oriac. Were there were there many other offers on the table? No, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I'd love to say, I'd love to say, um, you know, I turned down this and I turned it out, but Oriac was the first uh, concrete offer I got, and it was the first one I took. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it must. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to be in a position of luxury where you you get to pick and choose where you go and pick and choose what you want, but. I did. Uh, I didn't have that. Um, <laughs> didn't have that luxury. Yeah, like, and when when that offer will say comes in, is there is there part of you that like is time of the essence a little bit as well, where you obviously want to kind of give us a decent amount of toss and make sure it's the right move. But I would imagine there are dozens, if not hundreds, of rugby players being released out of out of contracts all around England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, France, and they are also looking for deals elsewhere. So. Do you kind of have to strike while the iron is hot with these things? No, ab- absolutely. And I suppose um, I just got married in August there as well. So um, I had to, had to you know, run it past uh, my wife or my fiance at the time, my wife now, um, just to say, look, is this is this something that works? And she was so supportive. Um, she was a nurse in, in Ireland and um, was able to, you know, take take a career break. And um, yeah, it's, it's suppose once, once I got that kind of green light, I knew, okay, there's no time to waste around here. I've been waiting for three, three and a half, four months to get something on the table. Let's just, let's just go now. So, um, and you know, I don't regret a single, a single part of it. Um, One thing you mentioned earlier on when you were talking about Paddy and you said they, he sent on the kind of the highlights video. I'm, I'm very curious about what these highlights videos are. What's in it? Is it all just the, like, are you just shown tackles? Are you shown pictures of you standing in the right place in defense? Is it all the good stuff? Do you throw in something that's maybe a little average, just to just to show there's a bit of honesty in you? Like who puts all that together? How does how does yeah. that highlights package work? Yeah, no, I suppose obviously I have a, an agency as well that that look after me. That trying to um trying to push me out and trying to the highlights package certainly consists of only all all your good stuff. As you know, I think someone said you know never seen a bad highlights package. <laughs> um, so so some it depends. Some clubs will look at a highlights package and say this guy fits the profile of, of what we're looking for. Whereas other teams will want to see three or four complete games. So to see the good stuff, to see the bad stuff and to get a kind of a better idea of what a player contributes in the 80 minutes. But yeah, for me to Oriac, I think they're just, just saw the highlights package and they had a, had a gap for me in, in their back row, second row. And uh, yeah, <laughs> as I said, it all happened pretty quickly. So when an offer comes in from Oriac, like how, how familiar were, were you with the club? Aside from the fact that, your friend Paddy McAllister had played with them. Yeah, I think, and that's that's about where the familiarity ended. I know uh, Jeremy Davidson, who'd went on to coach Breve, had coached him back uh, around 2015, 2016. They got to the Pro D2 playoff final. Um, and that's supposed where, where the familiarity, familiarity ended. Um, first thing you do probably is look it up where it is on the map and where the nearest airport is and how, how do you get there. Um, 
And yes, yeah, so we I think we're flying back from Toulouse. So we're about three hours north of Toulouse, uh, Toulouse Airport. And then in summertime, we have a summer airport about an hour and a half away called Rodez. So um yeah, that's kind of the first steps you take. And then you yeah, ask around maybe people who um who've been there and who play there. So Peter Nelson, who previously played at Ulster, is here as well. So I got on to him, contacted him. And then there's a, a young man here as well from Burr, Ronan Lachnan as well, who's in the academy here. And yeah, two two great guys to, I suppose, um, ask them about Oriac. And if I suppose any, anyone who's played in France as well, I'd always say Oriac is a very tough place to go and very t- tough place to live. But that's not been my experience so far. I think a lot of people saying that are people who are coming on big, long away trips uh, through the mountains to Oriac and it might be a bit wet or snowy in, in the winter. And that's their only impression of Oriac. But I've really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think those those away trips in the Pro D2 are, are famed at this stage, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I think uh, we're heading, as I said, to Rouen now. We have to leave on Thursday morning at half eight for a 10 or 11 hour bus journey up to up to the north of uh, France there, just above Paris. And uh, yeah, we'll be playing our game at half seven on Friday night and then a 10 or 11 hour bus journey back, probably arriving in Oriac nine or 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. So yeah, they're, they're certainly do it to travel a bit different. It, had you had you considered leaving Connacht at, at any other stages down through your career? I, I certainly remember a few years ago there was talk of interest from from Scotland, and obviously you've got a you know you've a Scottish father. You played under twenties with Ireland and Scotland, and that was that had been kind of floated a couple of times that you, you might end up playing Test rugby for Scotland. Was that was it ever something on the cards that you might depart Connacht a few years ago? Well, yeah, look, to be completely honest, when that stuff was floating around, um, I, I was thinking, God, I'm, I might have a decision to make here. And if that was the case, you know, I, I don't know what I would have done. I think, you know, certainly if it, if it was if it was the case now, I'd obviously jump at the chance to to play for Scotland or play Test Rugby for Scotland. And, you know, at the time, as I said, obviously I loved Connacht and wanted to stay at Connacht, but I don't know if it would be possible to play for Scotland and stay in Connacht. So, um, but to be perfectly honest, I think I'd never really heard anything about that. Nothing concrete was made. Um, I know when I, I obviously I made the choice myself to go to Scotland under twenties, and um, I was told you know they'd be they they'd stay in contact with me, and you know that was the last bit of contact that I had. So um, but as I said, look, it's definitely something I'm keen to explore in in the future myself, and um, obviously you know I'm playing in the Pro D two. I very much doubt I'd be I'd be on their radar, but um, you know if if an opportunity like that came up, I'd I'd, I'd certainly jump at it. But to answer your question, I suppose I had never really had an offered to leave Connacht before and you know I was very very happy in Connacht considered considered at home and uh yeah I, I was very keen would have been keen to stay again but I suppose as it's transpired and you kind of you're you're kind of let go I think the best thing for my career was to be let go and to to um to ex- experience playing rugby in France in the Pro D2 and see where it takes me on the you mentioned your last game for for Connacht against Zebra at the sports ground and you managed to get in and score a try as well I am um, I had a look. I had a look back at that that try actually there this afternoon. Um, it's the mo- so it's off line out mall. You come in and take it. I would say it's not exactly a classic shape. <laughs> Normally, I would have been expecting Dylan Tierney Martin, the hooker, to be coming in taking that ball at the back. Was that a was that an executive decision on the on the last day of the season that you know there's an opportunity here? I'm going for my try, or was that exactly how it's laid out in the on the training ground? Yeah, I, I think I think you're right that probably Dylan probably should have been the one scoring. That <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how it transpired. I think the lads at the front just did such a good job that there's there's no need for me to to transfer it back. And <laughs> I certainly wouldn't like to think I'm, I'm a greedy player, but uh, yeah, it was nice to certainly nice to sign off um, with a try at the end. And you know what? I, they're not the most glamorous tries, but for forwards especially, they're they're very very satisfying when uh, when you get them all try. It's, it's it's kind of a try for all the forwards. I know, like all joking aside as well, like when I was looking at it, when you get up off the ground, literally the first person standing over you is your your younger brother, Sean, as well. Like that was, that's a nice moment to have. Yeah, no, look, as I said, it, it was a great day. You know, someone said to me before it was, it was a fairy tale end. And I said, not really, you know, fairy tale end would have been in a final, in a URC final or in a Champions Cup final. But uh, it, it certainly wasn't, wasn't a bad finish for sure. So, um, no, it, it was a pretty cool day. And I, I suppose there was, a few other lads who played their last games as well, so it was definitely nice to to share share that all with them. And yeah, this is something I'm very appreciative of Andy Friend and the rest of the coaching staff for giving us that opportunity to to kind of say goodbye. When you look back over the the time at Connacht, like what are the what are the memories that jump out? I would imagine, obviously, the 
that entire 2015 16 season was incredibly memorable now i know you had a a very serious injury in the in the second half of that the, you know you probably all things going to plan you probably actually would have played in the the closing stages or in the the final against leinster at murrayfield but a, it was a very very serious knee injury but what are the what are the major highlights down throughout those what eight years from academy eight nine years from academy through to uh, nine, departing? Yeah, nine, nine seasons yeah i suppose i suppose um Look, there have been so so many like great moments as well. Um, I suppose first first of all, just maybe getting the opportunity to join the Connacht Academy. Obviously, I finished up with uh, Scotland under twenties and didn't really have have any academy place anywhere. And Nigel Carlin gave me the opportunity to come down on trial initially from the academy, and um, and then I suppose about three months three months into that, I remember there was a Connacht A game, and Pat Lamb came up to the game. We were playing Ulster up in Belfast, and Pat. Pat said to him, lads, you know, selection for next week's uh, uh, Rabble game, as it was at the time, because it's wide open, you know, we'll, we'll reward anyone who plays plays well tonight. And I um, I was just just 20 years of age and played played a decent game. And Pat was true to his word and selected me to make my debut uh, against the Scarlets in November 2013, you know, six months have, after, you know, not making the Irish under 20s, which was, which was pretty, pretty cool, you know, and very appreciative of Pat for that opportunity. Uh, and then I suppose... As you said yourself, the 2015-16 season was was filled with you know loads of loads of great memories. Um, obviously we won down in Tolman Park for the first time in in years. Um, and then obviously you know had had the knee injury as well, which was very disappointing. So the final, I suppose itself, was a little bit bittersweet, as as you said. Uh, but then getting back from that injury was another was another highlight, and getting back, you know, because I, I wasn't sure if the knee would be good at all, but it it came good, and that was certainly another another highlight as well and then obviously got the captain of the team on a couple of occasions which was brilliant some of the some of the wins we had in Champions Cup uh, at home to Gloucester and um, at home to Montpellier as well were, were big big days getting to play alongside my brother was was fantastic and then some of the other um, Interpro wins we had uh, away in Leinster and away in Ulster as well were were great were great days but um, yeah I suppose I'm, I'm talking about highlights there span over the full course of the nine years but uh I suppose that look and the lows as well. You know, there's stuff you learn from as well, and the the highs. You know, the lows make the highs seem seem even better. So, yeah, really, really great memories, and I suppose just the friends you meet along the along the way as well. The crack you have, some of the the, the journeys back from away games for Connacht as well. I'm talking about coming back from Rue and some of the journeys back from Connacht when you go away to places aren't the easiest as well. But the lads make the make a good crack, and yeah, lots of good memories. Were you on the? You're talking about the long journeys. Were you on the Siberia trip? No, I actually didn't. I actually didn't. We we were we were left behind. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of was a bit jealous of lads coming back saying they did the best time ever. It's, you know, and just that that was just part of the kind of the team at the time. That as you said, that 2015 16 year. I think Pat referenced it a few times that it really kind of brought everyone together. How they were stranded, you know, a frozen plane, uh, sitting in an airport, you know, everyone had you know, no showers, no sleep, but the lads just got on with it and had the crack and made the most of it, and it kind of brought the lads together a bit as well. So. Yeah, I wasn't one of those guys over there. So when they came back and telling us all the crack they had, it was, yeah, a little bit, a little bit uh, raging. Yeah, you're probably sitting at home there, nice and warm, when you hear about them being stuck, and you're like, oh, geez, I'm, I'm after escaping with one here, but you yeah. come back and you obviously have that fear of missing out, and you're, you're yeah. all the great stories. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think, I think at the time it was felt like we kind of won the jackpot, but now I'm kind of looking back as like that would have been a pretty cool experience to play in minus thirty degrees and experience that. <laughs> On, on um, on Oriac so far. Like, how does uh, the pro pro D two in general? We would see it over here. We get small little snippets every now and again, clips on Twitter, and it's it kind of just has this reputation of being a, a bear pit of a league where there's you see the most ludicrous tries, you see some ridiculous physicality. The Thursday night rugby even just seems to to bring out a kind of level of craziness in the league as well. It like how does this how does it compare with what you would have been used to in terms of the URC? Yeah, no, great, great question. I suppose the first thing I'd say about rugby in France in general is just that home form is is absolutely everything. So I suppose with us in Oriac now, you know, we're we've played fourteen games so far, seven at home, seven away. We've won seven out of seven at home and one from seven away. So uh, there's there's definitely that kind of. Um, I don't know if it's a mentality thing or just they just prioritize their home games and try to keep people fresh. But there's certainly a 
winning away from home is 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 a big big achievement. But and and winning your home games is just the abs- absolute minimum that's expected. Uh, the league in general is an incredibly tight league. I think, I think before last weekend we were we were sitting in like eight or nine position, but four points off off the playoffs in and then four points off the guys who are getting automatically relegated as well. So every team has beaten every team. It's, it's all very, very tight. I suppose in general about, about the rugby, as you're talking about, I think the ball in playtime is a little bit lower than usual than unless it came compared to the URC or compared to the, the top 14 here as well. But because of that, I think there's a lot more kind of playoff nine, a lot more kind of physicality, a lot more um, scrums and malls and set piece <sighs> stuff. So um, as a result, then you suppose they, they select guys and they look for guys who are those kind of, big set piece guys, big kind of heavy carriers, big heavy men, physical men. So, um, and we have a prop here as well, uh, Robbie Rogers, uh, Robbie Roberts, who um, played with uh, Montpellier last year when they won the top 14. He's, he's on loan with us now and he'd probably describe it to me as, you know, top 14 is probably a little bit faster, a little bit more ball and play, but Prodi 2 as a result is probably a little bit more physical. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Have you had to adapt your game much at all or, or kind of, the, the style of rugby you would have been suited to have you kind of fitted in well do you think um yeah no there's definitely a piece of you that has to kind of unlearn a few things maybe and adapt a little bit I suppose there is that element of jouer jouer a little bit and uh kind of see what happens which I kind of ha- have liked to be honest I found myself getting the, my hands on the ball a lot more and carrying the ball a lot more and being involved in lots of tackles and I suppose then just learning the language as well. And I've managed to call the lineouts the last couple of weeks and trying to, uh, obviously that takes a bit of, a bit of learning, a bit of adapting, getting used to, but um, yeah, there's, as I said, there's definitely, definitely maybe a bit less structure involved, but um, I, I've kind of enjoyed it in a way and being able to have multiple involvements and repeated involvements, which has been kind of suited me, I feel. And even just away from the rugby, like did, did you have much French going over? Like what, what's it been like is, you know, just being outside of the the bubble of home and outside of the bubble of Ireland. Yeah, no, I suppose I did French for my leaving cert in two thousand and eleven, and haven't really um haven't really felt the need to use it since then. But then, I suppose in February, then when I was looking for a new club, um, started the Duolingo on the phone and been kind of keeping my uh, streak going on that. And uh, I suppose yeah, the lads have been great. You know, a lot of guys here who want to learn what lot want to learn English you know, would speak, speak English to me and I'll try and speak French back to them. And they're learning English as I'm learning French. And I suppose Aurillac is a place that, as I said, you wouldn't maybe come on your holidays. So there's not much that English spoken here as well. So you're pretty much in at the deep end. And if you want to get your shopping done or want to get anything around town, you, you pretty much have to have a little bit of French and have to make the effort, which has been great, a great way to learn. So I think it's, it's the only way to learn. And finally, then before we finish up the the future. So it's a, was it a two, a one year or two year daily signs initially here? I have a two year here with the option of a third. Um, so yeah, as I said, we'll we'll see what happens. I'm uh, really enjoying my rugby at the moment here. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'm still keen to kind of be the best player I can be and and, and see where it takes me. So um, yeah, as I said I'm almost halfway through this first season already, which is which is incredible to think. And um, yeah, just just really enjoy my rugby. I've I've no intention of retiring anytime soon, and I, I think I'd like to keep playing in France for as long as I can. Yeah, and like like as you say, you're what turning turning thirty, turning yeah. thirty in a, in a few months' time, isn't it? Yeah, well, ages away, ages. Yeah, away. but he, no, but as in, <laughs> I think we mentioned like that that you had the bad knee injury in twenty in twenty sixteen. But from what I can tell, like you've had a pretty decent run of it injury wise, aside from that one big one throughout your career. Yeah, I, I think you know I've I kind of around Ireland under nineteen level, I dislocated my shoulder and I've had that bad knee injury that you mentioned. I think I broke my hand once as well, so. Yeah, I, as I said, I don't. I, I tend not to get injured too often, but when I do, I generally need to go for surgery and stuff. So when I when I do get injured, they, they tend to be long enough term ones. So um, yeah, touch wood, uh, been reasonably safe and reasonably uh unscathed, and exactly. I suppose that's that's the main thing, isn't it? I suppose in rugby, if you can stay fit and available, opportunities will come your way. And yeah, number Durab- one durability key in the in the pro D two. The number one ability is your availability. So yeah, and durability certainly in the pro D two is is certainly massive. Listen, Owen, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. I hope you enjoy your, your Christmas break back in Ireland and the rest of the season as well. And hopefully uh, you can stay in touch with those playoffs and have a nice little crack at them in the second half of the season. Thank you very much, Neil. Appreciate it.